All right, we have before us this morning, as Scripture tells us in Acts 13, 7, and I quote, an intelligent man, unquote, by the name of Sergius Paulus on the island of Paphos near Cyprus. Now, I've got a video, I mean, not another video, but I've got a slide here I want you to see. And you'll see that uh, Jerusalem, well, you don't see it, but Jerusalem is down here in the far corner. And you remember that uh, Christianity was called the way for quite a while. And then uh, it became known as Christianity in Antioch. Antioch kind of became the center of all uh, Christian activity at that time. And Paul's going to have his first missionary journey. And he's going to go, you see the red line, he's going to go down to, to Salamis and in the Isle of Cyprus and he's going to go to Paphos. So that's what we're going to be dealing with this morning. You can see the travel. And uh, that kind of travel was not easy. It's, it's not like it is for us today where you can jump in the car and take off somewhere or you can uh, get a plane ticket and take off halfway across the country. Just that journey right there in the water to get to, to the island itself is quite a journey for that to be able to happen. But that's where we begin this morning. We're going to see how this intelligent man handles hearing the gospel for the first time. But before we do, I want to remind you of, and if you have your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, turn to Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. Give us a little bit of background on what's motivating Paul. Why is Paul doing this? Why does he have a desire to do this? And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. So as the Holy Spirit fell upon those Christians, and their life began to be filled with Jesus Christ, Christ living in them, there was this motivation to let everyone know. We've talked about that before, and that is if you have experienced the greatest thing you've ever experienced in your entire life, there is a great tendency to want to share that with the people that you care about. With Christianity, you even want to share it with the people you don't care about. I know we're supposed to care about everybody, but you know what I mean. People maybe you don't have an, an affiliation with, or someone that's maybe not in your, your vein of companion so to speak. We have a desire to share that with everyone. Now if you'll turn over a little bit to Acts 5.28, we'll see how this was accomplished in Jerusalem. It says, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? In other words, those who had pulled them in was wanting to arrest them, basically says, we told you not to teach in the name of Jesus Christ. So they're saying, did we not strictly command you to not teach in this name? And look, and I want you to notice the next part of it. It says, and you have filled Jerusalem with this doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So even at the threat of being arrested, they continue to to fill Jerusalem with the doctrine. You see... That's just kind of something that happens to us when we get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to tell people about Jesus Christ. And uh, we need to make sure that we don't get intimidated by those around us and stop telling people about Jesus Christ. Now granted, we live in a world where it becomes less and less popular where it becomes more and more of a threat, it seems, to everyone when you even mention the name Jesus Christ. It used to be you would even hear Jesus' name in some songs. You turn on the radio, and even in secular songs, you'd hear the name of Jesus. Well, you don't hear that anymore. That's, That's not popular. Of course, the country people can still get by with Jesus in there once in a while. But most of the other songs, you're not going to hear Jesus at all, unless it's used as a swear word. Now, flip on over to Acts 8, 1. So we see the Great Commission, you know, going into all the world, which is what they did. We see that they did it in Jerusalem. And in Acts 8.1, we see the method that God used to be able to get this message out to other places rather than just in Jerusalem. So if you look at Acts 8.1, it says this. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. That's Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, 
except for the apostles. And as we talked about last week with that uh, mercury thing that I shared with you guys, it just spread. The Christians under the persecution, they began to go out into the outermost parts of the world, and as they did, they began to share the gospel. Now, my encouragement to us this morning is, guys, let's not forget to share Jesus Christ. Let's not be embarrassed to share Jesus Christ. Now, Christianity has gone through a lot of things, and the big thing used to be tracts. Now, you may be a tract person, you may not be a tract person, but one of the things you have to say about the tracts was that people were actively involved, at least in sharing their faith. They would go and have a meal or whatever, and when it was done, they would leave a tract on the table to tell them about Jesus Christ. Now, some people are more, more bold. They're able to do that one-on-one. Some would rather leave a tract. You know, it really doesn't matter the method by which we do it. The greatest way to do it is to live as a Christian. Because if we live as a Christian, that's going to be the greatest example we could possibly have in the lives of the people we know. But there also should be that boldness that allows us to just have this fire in us where we've got to tell people about Jesus Christ. Because after all, it is the single most important thing on the planet, actually beyond the planet. (laughs) Because this goes far beyond just our little universe. But it needs to be an important thing to us. So my encouragement to us as Christians is that we continue to bring Christianity to the uttermost parts of the world. Now when I say that, your first thought is probably some other country. Do you realize there's places right around here in Glendale where there's people lost, they're dying without Jesus Christ, they don't know the Lord, they're barely getting by, and a, and a, a, a hug, a meal, whatever could make all the difference in the world. A, a, a pair of clothes for their child to be able to start school with at the beginning of the school year. All of those things can make a tremendous difference if we do it in the name of the Lord. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Now, in that church that was at Antioch, and we already showed you from the, from the uh, map where Antioch was, in that church that was at Antioch, There were certain prophets and teachers. Then he begins to list them. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called uh, Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, Manahan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now, I want to mention something about prophets and teachers. They have a unique and distinct role, although sometimes they uh, cross borders if you will. Sometimes they're both used. But prophets, in the true sense of the word, they were there to guide the church. They were there to guide the church. The prophets were often there to say, look, you're out of bounds here. Let's get back in bounds. You look at the Old Testament prophet, their entire job was to say, look, you're not following the Lord. You need to follow the Lord. Or this is coming and you need to prepare for it. That's what God used. He used those prophets for that. But the teachers are there to ground the church. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the Old Testament prophets, they could be a little out there. And you all the time have people, well, maybe you don't all the time, but often we have people who will come to us and say, I have a word from the Lord. And I really think that God wants us to do this. Or he wants you, most of the time it's, he wants you to do this. Right? And... A church that's guided only by the prophetic word can get in a real mess. Because I'm not so sure that a lot of the so-called prophets we have today are truly prophets. Although they have schools for prophets. I don't know if you know that, but they have schools to try to teach people how to to be prophets. In the Old Testament, God did that. (laughs) Now they have to have schools to teach them that. But, but you still need the prophets. You still need those who will, not in the strict sense, but you still need those who hear from God and say, I have an idea. Let's try it. I love it when people come in and say, you know, I have an idea. Let's give it a shot. And I always say, well, God must be wanting to use you because you're the one with the vision. And about 90% of the time, that never happens. It never gets off the ground because the person with the vision doesn't want to do it. They want somebody else to do it. But you need people who will have vision. You need people who will go to the Lord and seek the Lord and come up with ideas. But you also have to have the teachers of the word to keep the church grounded. 
How are you going to know if the prophet's false? How are you going to know if the prophet's out in left field somewhere? Or the thing that they're suggesting or the direction that they're trying to get the church to go in, how are you going to know that it's correct or right if it doesn't correspond with the Word of God? And if we don't know what the Word of God is, we're not going to know whether it's true or not. And I think that's what gets a lot of churches in trouble. So in my experience, we need both. In fact, I think we even need to be that we need to be both sometimes in our lives. And I think even for us fathers that are here and moms, we need to have a little bit of both in our own family. What do I mean by that? Well, we need to be on our knees praying and hearing from God so that if God says, go do this or go do that or do this for your family, we can hear that and we know what that is. But we also need to be well-versed enough in God's word to where we can also say, that's got to be lined up with the Word of God because if it doesn't line up with the Word of God or if it doesn't correspond with the Word of God or if it's contrary to the Word of God, then it cannot be God speaking. So, they had both in this early church in Antioch and it appears as though they had quite a few of those. Amongst this group was Barnabas. Good old Barnabas. I've teased Eric about this. That son of comfort. He believed in Paul, remember, before anybody else really believed in Paul. Now, uh, Niger, he would represent modern-day Nigeria. Lucius was from Cyrene. Manahan, who before his conversion was tra trained under Herod the Tetrarch, that would have been Herod Antipas, the one who beheaded John the Baptist. And then finally we see Saul. Now, here's Saul. This is kind of a mixed group of guys, wouldn't you say? Here's Saul. He's the one who held the coats of the people who stoned Stephen to death. That's what the church is made of. But look around. <laughs> Such people were we. We come from all walks. We come from all places in our life. And for most of us, if we had a little film strip going on right now of what our life was like before Jesus Christ, we'd probably be pretty embarrassed. You see, because God doesn't choose perfect people. He just chooses willing people. And then he begins to work on our hearts to equip us and train us to do his will and to do his work. But one of the things we do see from these guys, even with all their previous lives, we see that they are in prayer. God had united them in prayer because of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Separate. Isn't that really what a Christian is? A separated one? When we become a Christian, when we wear the label of Christianity, we are basically saying to everyone, I am a Christian. I am separated from the world. I am other or more than what I used to be. I finally realize what God wants me to be and I've invited the Lord into my heart and now I am separated from the world. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. And as Christians, and I know most of you are, as Christians, we think a little differently, don't we? We pray differently. Hopefully, we act differently. We still hurt. We still get sick. We still have pain. We still die. You know, the mortality rate among human beings is 100%. <laughs> That's a fate we're all, we're all going to. And you know, it's kind of funny. As you get older, I understand now here why old people always think about dying. Because when you get to a certain age, I'm not there yet, by the way. <laughs> well, who knows? But the thing of it is, when, when they get to a certain age, all their friends and people around them start dropping off. And one of the worst things my mom used to do was look at the obituary column all, every, every week, you know, to see who was dropping off. And then you start calculating, you know, well, I'm this old and who knows? 
<laughs> you know? And so you start realizing there's just a, a certain amount of time left. But one thing that's different with us is that we have been called to be separate. So even in all of those things, even when God takes us home, we look at that differently. Right? We look at that differently. We look at that as a graduation rather, don't get me wrong, it's not like we're just happy. I told my wife, don't be happy when I'm gone, but don't miss me that much. Because I'm gonna, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be with the Lord. In that kind of a situation where we end up without, uh, you know, we, we end up being in the presence of, of God, we still think differently. In our sicknesses and in our illnesses, we still hurt, we still go through lots of things, but we still know that God's somehow in the middle of it and instead of being without hope instead of being with, without any way to go or any place to go we can go to the Father and we can pray like we did at the beginning of this service and reach out to the people not only in our congregation but to those that are at home so we are different we are set apart now I want to give you something out of Ezekiel 44 verses, uh, verse 11 Ezekiel 44 11 Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers of the house and ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offerings and the sacrifice for the people and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Now, he's, he's pretty much talking about the priests, those that would officiate in the, in the temple. And understand that the primary function of the priest, which I think has gotten lost through the years, but the primary function of the priest was to represent God to the people and represent the people to God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it was their job to basically say, this is what God requires. And back then, guys, if you sinned, you had to kill something. There was a sacrifice of blood. So whether it was a, a dove or a goat or a ram or whatever it might be, there was the sacrifices that God required. So there was a lot of bloodshed. But it was their job to tell people what was required. But it was also their responsibility to be on their knees praying for the people and representing the people back to the Lord. You see it in Moses. Even though Moses was not technically a priest, he spiritually was a priest. And he represented the people to God. When God was basically saying, hey, I want to start all over again, <laughs> he said, no, Lord, have mercy upon the people. So you see them in that, and this is what we're talking about in Ezekiel 44, verse 1. So as servants of the Lord, these men had a sense, in a sense, become priests. Now, you might go, well, how does that relate to me? Well, when you and I become Christians, we, in a sense, become priests, spiritually, spiritually. We're supposed to represent the people to God and God to the people. What do you mean by representing the people to God? Well, don't you do that for your family? Aren't you on your knees praying for your sons and your daughters and your moms and your grandpas and everybody else? Don't you represent the people to God? God, have mercy upon them. God, we love them, heal them. You're doing that all the time. And aren't you also representing God to them? Don't we also try to teach our children who God is, why he's there, the fact that he loves us, try to answer those big questions like why the sky is blue and all those, how many angels can sit on the head of a pen, you know, all those difficult things that our kids and people ask us. But you guys get the idea. We, in a sense, become, as Christians, we, in a sense, become priests and priestesses, if you will. So, they are separated. We are separated. Okay, let's move on. I want to give you Ezekiel 44, verse 15. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood. There is exactly condensed what I was just trying to tell you, that representation. So they get together and they're saying, okay, what do we need to do? How do we further Christianity? And it says that they, and I quote, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to do. So they got together and they said, Lord, what do you want us to do? When was the last time we said that prayer? Now I know we get busy 
And finding time to pray sometimes is tough. But we usually go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need this and I need this and I need this and I want this and watch over my kids and watch. But when was the last time we finally said, at the end of all that, Father, not my will, but your will be done and what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do next? You guys have heard me in the last couple teachings to challenge us all to say that prayer. God, what do you want me to do next? So many times the enemy tries to tell us that the last chapter was the end of the chapters. Whatever it was that we did, whether it was our last job, whether it was our marriage, no matter what it is, he tries to tell us that was your greatest thing. That was your greatest accomplishment. You're pretty much done now. But you know what? God is never through with his kids. So guys, whether you're 18 and whether you're 81, we still need to be praying, God, what do you want from me next? What is it that you require? So look at thir- verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed, the Lord laid hands on, excuse me, they laid hands on them and sent them away. I know that when the Lord called me here, um, it wasn't necessarily because I wanted to come down here. I think I've shared with some of you guys that uh, my pastor at the time, and we started the Bible study in a home, and that home fellowship began to grow and began to grow. And my pastor, Bob Claycamp at the time, he says, I think it's time for you to decide what you want to do. <laughs> either, you, you know, either go ahead and continue on with Central or one or the other because it's, it's growing down there and you've got to kind of decide. And I shared with you guys how my wife and I were very involved with the with the fellowship and we loved being there and we were doing things that we really enjoyed and so it wasn't like there was anything wrong and uh, and I remember going into the sanctuary uh, about like where we are now and I I got on my face and I began to pray and ask the Lord if he what he wanted for from us whether he wanted us to stay or whether he wanted us to come down here and I and I remember uh, that I had prayed and I and I was still laying there and I lifted my head up a little bit and all I could see were the legs of the chairs. From that perspective, all I could see was the legs. And the Lord said, the field's white with harvest. So there's definitely a need. If you want to go, I'll bless you. If you want to stay, I'll bless you. But I just felt, I knew, I knew in my heart at that moment that God wanted us to come down here and start Calvary Chapel Central Phoenix. And we've been here ever since. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I've heard people say, well, why did you stay? And, and, and the simple thing is, is, is God's always told me to stay. There's been other opportunities, but this is where God has told me to stay, and this is why I've been here all this time. But I knew that I knew that I knew this is what God wanted from me. Now, convincing my wife of that <laughs> was, was another whole story. And so I knew there was going to come a time when I needed to kind of plant that seed in her, in her heart. So I, I mentioned it one day, and uh, now we had already been married a few years, so I was a little smarter than I was when we first got married. So I kind of just planted the seed, and, and she was, had the same response I did at first. Well, why would you want to do that? Everything's fine here. And I says, I know, but just think about it. And then I just left it alone. And then every once in a while she would go, well, what about this? And then a little later she'd go, well, what about this? And what about this? And I, and I saw a little bit of the excitement beginning to develop in her heart. And I knew we couldn't do this unless it was both of us, unless God was calling us to do this. You see, that's that praying and that fasting and waiting upon the Lord and knowing that God has sent you. And then when she finally said, I believe God's calling us to do the same thing. Then we knew that we had that separation, that God had separated us, not only as Christians, but he had separated us to this work, and this is what he wanted us to do. Look at verses 4 and 5. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, that's important. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. Um, I want to show the map again if it's not too difficult to pull that up. Okay, see, from Antioch to Seleucia, starts in Antioch, so they head down to Seleucia, and then from there it says, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, 
And when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John Mark as their assistant. So again, not too far. Well, it's, it, from the map, it's still pretty far from Antioch to Seleucia. So that's where they began. Start in Jerusalem. At the church started in Jerusalem. It's centered in, in Antioch. And then Paul and, and uh, Barnabas are heading on the first missionary journey. So they're going down to Seleucia and then heading on over the other way. So it says that when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John Mark as their assistant. Now, I want to say this to you guys. There is a big difference between being sent and just wanting to go. This is really crucial in a Christian's walk in life. Now, I know that what you're thinking about is the context of our message this morning, and that's missions. But it's not all missions. How about wanting to buy a new car? There's a difference between wanting to buy a new car and God saying, it's time, you need to buy a car. There's a big difference between wanting a new house and God saying, it's time, it's, it's okay, Let's, this is the time, I want you to do it. There are so many, many things in life where we're ruled by our flesh, we get excited about something, and we just want to do it without praying. And we've seen examples in the Bible of men, men of God, who just said, go for it, and didn't really pray about it, and it always turned out poorly. We need to pray so that we know that it is God that's saying, go ahead and do this. It saves us so much trouble. But oftentimes, we get excited about it. We move on it because we're afraid God might say no. It's like, I'm really excited about this. It's got to be God. It's got to be God. God's opened so many doors. Look at all the doors that God's opened. Satan, I, I, I need to say, say this. Be careful. Be careful. There can be some doors open up that might not be God. It might not be the Lord. So just be careful. You, 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 can't, you can't just go by that because sometimes those are just feelings. You got to go back and you got to ask God, God, what is it that you want me to do? Being sent by the Holy Spirit. It's a good thing to know you're sent by the Holy Spirit or you bought the car by the Holy Spirit or you married in the Holy Spirit because life gets tough. Even if you're married to the most wonderful person in the world, which my wife is. No, I'm just kidding. I am married to the most wonderful person in the world. And even if you're married to the most wonderful person in the world, you still have bumps, right? You still have things you have to work through no matter what it is. You go out and buy that brand new car. Even if God says, go ahead and buy the car, you still got to put oil in it and you still got to put gas in it. And you got to have somebody who will wash it for you, <laughs> right? So you still have to maintain it. There are always bumps in the road. It's always nice when you're in the middle of a trial and you can look back and say, but I know I'm where I'm supposed to be because I know that God told me this is what I need to do. Because then you're not second-guessing the whole thing. Because you know that God is in it. We're going to see John Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, a little bit more. But he didn't do so well on this trip. It was his first time out and he didn't do so well. Look at verses 6 and 7. Now when they had gone through the isle, excuse me, gone through the isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul. Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now, Bar-Jesus means the son of Jesus. Interesting, isn't it? But it's not the same Jesus you and I know. Calls himself Bar-Jesus, calls himself the son of Jesus, but he doesn't know the Jesus that you and I know. Where's the lesson in that for us? There's a lot of people claiming Jesus these days. Or God. But I can tell you this, in many cases, it's not the same Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the gospel. It's a Jesus that they have made up. Or it's a Jesus or a gospel that they have amended 
or it's a gospel that they have deleted parts of it. But it's not the same Jesus. Most false prophets, most good false prophets, kind of sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Most good false prophets claim some kind of an association with the living God. You see, if you're going to be a good false prophet, you've got to be spiritual, don't you? Being spiritual doesn't mean you're Christian. And a good false prophet will have enough of the Bible, enough of God in it to where it'll sound very, very Christian, but it may not be Christian at all. This false prophet finds himself in the company of the royal, excuse me, the Roman, it would have been royal, but it, the, the Roman appointed uh, governor, and that is Sergius Paulus. And it find it interesting, I find it interesting, it says here that he's an intelligent man, but here it is, guys. He's an intelligent man, but he can't tell he's in the company of a false prophet. How intelligent is that? I would like to propose that intelligence is not the same as wisdom. You can be in a, a very intelligent individual and not know how to change a tire. Or put oil in the car. You can have several degrees and lack in some of the basic things in life. So he was an intelligent man, but he wasn't a man of great wisdom. But at least he had enough desire that he wanted to hear what Paul and Barnabas had to say. Now let me go back to us parents. We may have a lot of knowledge. And if you, if you rate you on the IQ charts, maybe they, you're off the charts in IQ. But that's not the same as having a direct connection to God. That's not the same thing as being filled with the Spirit of God through a relationship with Jesus Christ to where you get things that you can't get any other way. You're tap, you have this constant Bluetooth connection with God. Okay, maybe not Bluetooth, maybe hardwired. But you're constantly connected to God so that at any point in time He wants to communicate to you, He's got that ability. Look at verse 8. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so was his name translated, he withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He wanted, he didn't want Sergius Paulus to hear the gospel. You see, he's in his pocket. He's his right hand man. He is his counselor. And I'm sure that that is profitable to him. And he does not want him to hear the gospel because he's afraid that if he hears the true gospel, he will have no need for him. So he tries to turn him away from that. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, please. If you turn to Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's a tall order right there. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. And yet, as human beings, that's probably our first motivation without even knowing it. How does this benefit me? How's this going to make me feel? That's being human. I'm not saying it's the best way to be. But it is being human. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God helps us to overcome this selfishness. And it says, ambition or conceit. Conceit. Am I conceited? I think that's the question we got to all ask ourselves. Am I conceited? I bet you all of us would say, no, I'm not conceited. I bet we are. I bet we are. That's the only way you can look at a mirror at my age and think, I look all right. 
or at any age. I remember telling Pastor Rod one time because, you know, he struggles with his weight. I struggle with my weight and I would lose some and he would lose some. And I said, you know, no matter how much weight we lose, we're still 60 something. (laughs) It is hard to overcome that selfishness and overcome that conceit. And we see here Elimus, bar Jesus, he's full of himself. And the only, he's not thinking about Sergius Paulus' eternal salvation. He's not thinking about his life. He's only thinking about how it all affects him. If he were, he would not have been trying to turn him away from Jesus, but trying to bring him to Jesus. Again, in Philippians 1, 15 and 16, the first part of 16 says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition and not sincerely. Nickels and noses. What's in it for me? How much can I make? What's the, how many attaboys can I get from doing that? But Jesus is encouraging us all to do what we do out of love. To kind of take that moment... Even if that flesh comes up, take that moment, rely upon the Holy Spirit about it, pray the Holy Spirit about it, and then turn around and say, Lord, how do I get out of this? No, not, not what you want me to do, but how do I stay out of it? How do I do this? If I can do it anonymously, how do I do it in such a way that I can be a blessing to that individual and not take any credit for myself? How can I get to the point to where I don't think I know everything? In fact, I know I know so little. How can I get to the point to where I get out of the way and Jesus is in the way? There are so many Pied Pipers out there. You guys know what the Pied Piper is, right? They're out there and they're leading people to them. They're leading people to them because of, of their talents or their, or their gifts. But the reality of it is, you and I can't help people. God can. You and I don't have the strength to be the kind of an individual that people need because our shoulders are too small. God's are not. I think we can be pretty sure that Bar Jesus is a fake. All right, 9 through 11. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, He looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. You want to make sure you're speaking for God when you say that, right? (laughs) You enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now, I, I like that. Shortest shortest distance between two points is what? A straight line. That's kind of what he's saying here, isn't it? You're perverting the straight ways of the Lord. What God requires of us is a pretty straight line. You know what sin does? Sin is like... it's, It's crooked. Sin is crooked. The flesh is crooked. Instead of having a straight line to Jesus Christ, making life simple, the enemy will try to get you and I off track, wasting time out in the middle of the wilderness. And a two-week journey will turn into 40 years. That's what the enemy wants from us. This is what Bar-Jesus was trying to do in this situation with Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus. He didn't want him to know the Lord. So he comes in and he tries to divert him. But Paul stands up. Guys, we all have to be a Paul sooner or later. Most of us don't like confrontation, but sooner or later we have to stand up and say, the way you're headed is wrong. What you're saying is wrong. This is false information. Sooner or later we have to do that. We have to do that with our children. And as much as we want to remain their friend, as much as we love them from the moment that we lay eyes on them, and that just deepens and that grows through the years, 
as much as there is such deep love for them, there are times when you have to say things that you know they're not going to like. There are times when we're going to have to stand up. We're going to have to stand up against the things that seek to pervert and the things that seek to destroy. If you're a young person here and you have a Christian parents that love you, don't despise them when they tell you you're going down a wrong path. You, you, you should be so grateful that you have a mom and a dad that are willing to stand up and point you in the right direction. I know it's tough sometimes because they're sometimes going to say things you don't want to hear. But you really are blessed to have somebody who loves you enough and cares enough about you to do that. So he's saying, don't pervert the straight ways of the Lord. Verse 11, and now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind now, when he says the hand of the Lord is upon you, he didn't mean that the hand of the Lord had always been upon him when he was falsely teaching. He's saying, right now, the, ho- the hand of the Lord is on you. But understand what happens when the hand of the Lord is on him. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time, and immediately a dark mist fell upon him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now, I, I have nothing to base this on, but I know God. And I know it's his desire that this man turns his heart around. I know that it's, this blindness probably wasn't permanent unless he chose to remain in the darkness. We saw the same thing happen to Paul, right? Paul couldn't see for a while. He repented, got right with the Lord's sight returned. We don't really have true vision unless we have God and have the Holy Spirit. Now, we see Saul, we see Paul in the same verse. His Jewish name, which meant, as Saul, it means the requested one. You remember Paul describing himself? The Jew of Jews. I was born the third day, a tribe of Benjamin. You know, on and on and on. He talks about his credentials, uh, the, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. That's when he was the requested one. We also see his Roman or Gentile name, which means Paul, which means little one (laughs) I love it all in the same sentence here's the requested one the Holy Spirit he surrenders his life and he becomes the little one and he's okay with that he's okay with that in fact he's blessed by that and you know what folks we need to become the little ones this is the same Paul that said in 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. This is Jesus saying in uh, Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. Oh, that we could get that. We live in a world where you got to be strong. You got to be powerful. The more powerful, the more strong you are, the more that you accomplish, the more tweets you get, the more friends you have on Facebook, just the more of everything you have that makes you somebody. Actually, it just makes you waste a lot of time. Now, I'm not against either one, I'm on both. But the point is, you can get on there and get lost. You can get on there and get lost. And I don't know about you, but most of the times I go on Facebook, I end up depressed. (laughs) Seriously, I do. I don't want to know that much about everybody. You know, I really don't. I don't care if you had a bowel movement today. (laughs) I don't care what you had for breakfast, you know. And then you see people that you love and respect, and they, they toss something out, and you're going, oh, why did you say that? Why did you... Why did you, you do that? And, and then you pray. <laughs> Paul may have been the little one, but he's going to be mighty in the lives of Sergius Paulus, him and Barnabas both. Here's this one guy trying to be a big shot. Paul and Barnabas just kind of come in, just sliding under and doing what God wants them to do. You see, because 
the battle truly does belong to God and God is already working in his heart all they got to do is just pick up the pieces pick up the bread that's left over that's all that they need to do look at verse 12 Acts 13. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now this intelligent man became a wise man because of the Holy Spirit in his life. All of his knowledge had brought him to a cheap imitation by the name of Bar-Jesus. And without Jesus in this world, it always brings us to some type of cheap imitation. But his wisdom brought him to the Lord. I'll close with this. Moses was a murderer. Joseph was sold into slavery by his own family. Rahab was a prostitute. David's own father didn't consider him king material. Peter denied Jesus three times. And Paul was a killer of Christians. Jesus changes people.